If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 107. It's going to seem familiar to you because Pastor John took us through this psalm. But I felt led to go through it again. And so that's what we're going to do tonight. And the title of this study is, Let the Redeemed of the Lord Say So. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you are redeemed and know it, you will say so. If you're not redeemed, you won't. If you're redeemed and don't know it, you won't. It's my prayer tonight that with the help of the Lord, we'll know it. Because the redeemed should say so, the redeemed should say so. In this amazing psalm, there's going to be a repetition of two verses. Four times they're going to repeat. And with each time we have a different picture of God's redemptive work in the life of an individual. We're going to see it in the searching soul. And we all are that. We're going to see it in the shackled soul. We were that. We're going to see it in the sin sick soul. And we're going to see it in the storm tossed soul. And then if we're wise, we will all be studious souls. As the psalmist will tell us how we should respond to this great redemption that we have. And then, Lord willing, we're going to cover 108 at the end of our study tonight. Psalm 108. We're just going to briefly touch on it. So don't get too excited about how many verses we're going to cover in 107. 107 starts off the same way 106 did. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. God is good. God is good. And his mercy endures forever. Justice, as we just sang, is what we deserve. Justice is getting what you deserve. That's the definition of justice. Mercy, mercy is not getting what you deserve. And grace is getting what you don't deserve. Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is, is not getting what you deserve. And grace is getting what you don't deserve. And God has bestowed his grace upon us because he is good. And we should thank him for that. We should never cease to thank him for it. And then the psalmist says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let them say, God is good. Let them say, God is merciful. Whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. That word redeemed. The idea is a goel in the Greek. A kinsman redeemer. If you want to know what a kinsman redeemer is, what a kinsman redeemer looks like, now you could do a study in the Old Testament. Leviticus shares with us some of the things that a kinsman redeemer would do. If, if you were sold into slavery, if you had to sell yourself into slavery and you couldn't buy back your redemption, your kinsman redeemer, someone within your family, your next of kin could buy you back out of slavery. If a woman was married to an Israelite man and that man was now deceased, a kinsman redeemer could take her in and take care of her. And that is beautifully told, this romance of redemption. I've read it multiple times recently, the book of Ruth. We've studied it together. You can go back online and listen or just read it again. 
It's an amazing story of this Moabite woman whose husband is now deceased and her mother-in-law and her father-in-law left Israel because of a famine. They moved too soon. They didn't wait on God and they left Israel. Her husband dies, both of her sons die and the women are left alone. And Naomi hears that there's bread in Jerusalem. There's bread in Jerusalem, which there ought to be bread there because Bethlehem means the house of bread. And so she tells her two daughter-in-laws, I'm going back. You two go back home to your people, to your gods. And they have this time there, the three of them, they're weeping, they're crying. And, and one of the daughter-in-laws named Orpha, she's, she's telling her mother-in-law, I'm going to stay with you. And Ruth is saying, I'm going to stay with you. And she says, look, I can't have any more children. There's no reason for you to stay with me. Go back home. And Orpha kisses her and walks away. But the Bible says that Ruth clave to Naomi. And Naomi tried to get her, go back, go back, go back. And Ruth says, I'm not letting you go. I am not letting you go. I'm going wherever you go. I'm going to live wherever you live. Your people are going to be my people. Your God's going to be my God. And wherever you die, that's where I'm going to die. And so they go back to Jerusalem together. They have nothing. They have nothing, no means to support them. And so Ruth says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go find a field where I can glean and we can get some kind of food. They would leave the corners of their field in Israel so that the poor could glean. They could get a little bit off the four corners of the field. And the Bible says it just happened that Ruth walked upon the field of a man named Boaz who she had no idea was a kinsman redeemer. An individual in their family line that could take care of them. And it's a beautiful, romantic, redemptive story. I would encourage you. It's only four chapters. It won't take you long to read it. But Boaz is this picture of Jesus, our kinsman redeemer. His name means swiftness. And in chapter 3, the end of chapter 3, they realize that this is Boaz and, and Ruth has asked him to redeem them. He's agreed to do it, but there's another near kin to him. And so he wants to give him that opportunity. But Naomi says this to Ruth, just sit still, my daughter. Because, I'll paraphrase, he will waste no time in taking care of this. Which pictures how eager Jesus is to redeem us in a full spectrum of redemption. And we're going to see the first one in a searching holtz, a searching soul. Every one of us, everyone you know is searching for Jesus Christ. I can say that with absolute certainty. The Bible says, as the deer pants after the water, so my soul pants after you. And that's saved and unsaved alike. That's why we're living in a world where people are searching and searching. They're searching with alcohol, drugs, careers, power, you name it. I could name some other things, but we've got a mixed crowd in here. You guys are adults. You can let your imagination go. But they are searching. And this is what they're searching for. Jesus Christ. They, they might not know it, but that's what they're searching for. And that's why their search goes on and on and on and on. And no matter how much they do a thing, or how much they take of a thing, or how much they gain of a thing, it's never enough. Because there's a God-shaped hole on the inside of every one of us. And he is the only thing. It doesn't matter what you try to stuff in there or how much you try to stuff in there. It's never going to satisfy the longing of your heart. Only he can. Look what he says. He gathered them out of the lands from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south. There's coming a day in heaven where there's going to be a multitude of people that we're going to stand in the midst of. And they are going to come from all the corners of the world. Every nationality, every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every color. He's gathered them. 
And I can almost hear Jesus weeping over Jerusalem as he says, how often have I desired to gather you? I wonder tonight, can you hear his voice? He's crying. He's calling out. He's calling your name. He's calling my name. He longs to gather you. He knows you're searching. You're searching. There was a time I was groping in the dark, as Paul says in the book of Acts. I was, I was looking and stumbling and fumbling. Look what he says. He's gathered them. And then in verse 4, they wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way, searching high and low, near and far, going to and fro, trying to find maybe what they don't even know. But it's the Lord. They found no city to dwell in. Before Jesus, I can just about bet you never seemed to fit anywhere. Maybe that's the way you are right now. Maybe, maybe even though you know who Jesus is, there's this sense in you that no matter where you go, you just don't fit. You, you just haven't found a place where you feel like you can just stop. I can tell you tonight, if and when you find Jesus, the search is over. You'll never have to go looking anywhere else. They wandered aimlessly. They were looking. They were searching. As a result, they kept going. Verse 5, they were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted in them. They searched and they searched and they went and they went and they looked and they looked till they were exhausted. Running on empty. But Jesus says, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they just might, no. They shall be filled. If there's a longing in your soul tonight, and you might not even know what, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm looking for something. I, I, there, there seems to be something missing. I can't just put my finger on it, but I've been looking for it my whole life. It's him. It's him. I would tell you with open arms, fully embrace him tonight. He will not let you down. He will satisfy. Notice, they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them out of their distresses. They cried. He heard. He delivered. And he led them forth by the right way. By the right way. I've been every which way under the sun. I have. Most of my life, I've been as, as they, I had a pastor to say this. I thought it was funny. I, I, it stuck. As confused as a termite in a yo-yo. I didn't know which way was up and which way was down most of the time. Life just spinning. Didn't know where I was at. Didn't really know how I got there. Until one night when I was 15 years old, I can't even tell you how I ended up. First Church of the Open Bible, a little bitty old raggedy two-story building where kids were sent and all the leftovers from the sanctuary, you know, all the old chairs, old pews, old broke down everything that should have went in the dumpster. They put it out there for the kids and for the youth. And I walked in that door on a Wednesday night. And I was searching and didn't even know it. I thought I'd found what I was looking for. But I knew in my heart that it did not satisfy. And that night, I met a man named Jesus Christ. And he heard my cry. And he delivered me. And the rest is history. And over 30 years later, it is sweeter today than it was on that night. It's better now than it has ever been. And I thought that night it couldn't get any better. They cried and he led them forth in the right way. 
If I asked you tonight, where are you going? Where are you headed? What's the direction of your life? Where, 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 are you, what, where are you pursuing? What's the next year look like? The next five years, the next 10 years? Where, where, where are you going? Apart from Jesus, you have to honestly say, I don't know. Because without him, you do not know the way. Because he is the way. Oh, read the Bible and you'll find the way. If you don't find Jesus reading it, you won't. And there's a lot of people who have read the Bible and they've come up with their own crazy way. And you guys are smiling and shaking it because y'all have heard some of the crazy. Maybe some of y'all have attempted it. Some of the crazy. I know I have. He is the way. He, he will lead you. So that every step, the Bible says, the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. Imagine living life where every step was a step of confidence. You didn't have to wonder, am I, am I, uh, I don't, uh, okay, I'm a child, uh, you know, break the ice. Every step, every step. The Lord told Joshua, every place your foot goes, I've given it to you. Just walking by faith, walking in the spirit, just following Jesus. Wow. That they might go to a city of habitation. The searching soul finds a habitation, finds a home, finds a place. I now fit. <laughs> I have found my fit. I found my home. And it's not the house that I live in. Jesus is my habitation. He's where I dwell. And that's why, listen, that's why Paul said, I've learned in whatever state I'm in. I'm in Alaska. I'm at home. If I'm in D.C., I'm at home. If I'm in New York, I'm at home. If I'm in Florida, I'm at home. If I'm in Alabama, I'm at home. Because I've found my habitation. And that's why Jesus says to you and he says to me, abide in me. That's why the Bible talks about being in Christ. I'm not wandering anymore. I'm not searching anymore. My Redeemer has found me and brought me to himself. That word redeem means to buy out. He purchased me. I'm his. The search is over. Verse 8, the psalmist says, because of this, he says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men! Exclamation mark. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I was lost, but I'm not lost anymore. I'm living in a world full of lost people, but I'm not lost. I see them. They're just running around like when you, when you step on an ant bed. <laughs> and they just... And you're just, oh, it's sad. <laughs> Believe it or not, it happens to people in the church. Especially when you say to them, hey, why don't you just sit still for 20 minutes? Just find a place, get still, get quiet, and just say, Lord, I'm here. I'm listening. I can't sit still for 20 minutes. Why not? I just, I can't. Yes, you can. You can sit still for two hours. You can. When you find your habitation, when you find what you're looking for, oh, Mm, mm, mm. For he satisfieth the longing soul. That word longing means to go to and fro, to search. It literally means searching. And that's what we're talking about. The searching soul. It was lost, but no more. Because Jesus is our habitation. He's where we dwell. And I'm not going to be moved for forever. For I'm never moving again. I have found my eternal 
residence. I have arrived. <laughs> oh, verse 10. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, the shackled soul. In chains, in bondage. Oh, well, I ain't in no bondage. I'm American. I'm free. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. Because they rebelled against the words of God and condemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Wow. They were shackled. They were in chains. They were in bondage. And most of the time we hear stuff like that and we sit in places like this in the church and we think, oh, well, those are the people who are struggling with addiction. <laughs> the people who are struggling with addiction are in better shape than most of the people sitting in church. Did the preacher just say that? Because most of the people that are sitting in church don't even know that they're in shackles and bondage. So you can, you, can, you can typically see addiction. You, you can kind of see the outworkings of that over time. But there's some, there's some bondage that happens in church pews where people have sat in churches for 20 years and we don't see it. Nobody, nobody knows it's there. It's easier to cover up. It doesn't necessarily always manifest itself outwardly. The religious leaders said to Jesus, we are not in bondage. We have never been enslaved to anyone. And Jesus says, whosoever sins is a slave to sin. So whether it's your jealousy or your anger or your bitterness or your unforgiveness or your gossip or whatever it might be, your pride, those things that are sins in your life that maybe nobody sees except maybe the people in your house, like my anger used to be. Oh, I'd come in here. I'd put on a show for y'all. Get to the house, act a fool. Yeah. They were in shackles. And, and he brought them down, the Bible says, with labor. Sin is a hard task master. Satan will dangle whatever it is in front of you. It's shiny and sparkly and boy, watch it wiggle. And you just can't help yourself. Your eyes get big and you just dart forward and poof, fish on, fish on, fish on. And he will wear you out. You will tuggle and you will struggle and you will fight and you'll shake your head and you'll twist your tail and you'll jump out of the water and back into the water. And he will wear you out. But here's the good news. There comes a cry, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, if you'll come to me, I'll redeem you. I'll purchase you out of slavery, out of your bondage, from your hard task master, master, and you'll serve me and follow me, and it'll be easy street. I got myself a good master. I got a good master. In the Old Testament, after you had served for six years, you were allowed to go free in the seventh year. But the Bible says if you, if you had developed a, a husband, I mean a wife and children and those kind of things with your master, you could go free, but your wife and your children that you had had with under your master had to stay because they belonged to your master. But if a servant in that seventh year said, I love my master and I love my wife and I love those things that he's given me, I don't want to leave. Then that servant could go to the doorpost of the house and the master would take an awl and drive it through the ear of the servant. And he would be a bond slave for life. I used to serve a hard task master. 
I knew what it was like to be in bondage and in slavery. But I've been redeemed. I've been purchased. I thought, I thought, well, maybe this is going to be no different than what I've had, right? I'll, I'll give it a try. But his love and his grace was something I've never experienced in my life. His goodness that he bestowed upon me. And this yoke was just a perfect fit. And it, it was just easy to serve him. And the more I got to know him, And I could leave right now. But not on your life. See, he, he doesn't hold me here. He doesn't force me to stay here. But I can't help myself. The more I get to know him, where am I going to go? Where am I going to go? So here they are, they're just, they fall down. There's none to help. The Lord will let you keep trying. Listen. Oh. The Lord will let you keep trying until you give up. And family members and church members and brothers and sisters and friends, we do everything we can to keep people from getting to that place. We rescue them over and over again. Oh, oh, we, we read, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Leave them alone and pray. That's what you can do. Well, that's not loving. They're going to hate me. They might, they'll change their mind. Because the sooner you get to the end of yourself, the better off you'll be. If there's, tonight, if there's a little bit of fight left in you, I, I, give me one more chance. All I need is one more I said, get it out of your system. Go, go, go. Here's 50 bucks. Go. Because you need to get to that place where you look around and you realize, you come to that place where you say, there is nobody. And you cry out. Look, at, look, look. It's a, repeat, a repeated refrain. Verse 13, then they cried out unto the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands asunder. He that the son is set free is free indeed. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. That's why we gather here, I hope, to know the truth. The more you know the truth, the more free you'll be. If it's not setting you free, it's not the truth. You study the truth. It'll change you. And there's no bars, no gates that can hold you. The Bible says that Jesus is making a church that the gates of hell can't prevail against. George Washington, he never made me that free. Oh. Verse 17. The sin sick soul. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquity, are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. I hope tonight you have come to that place that you are sick of sin. Sick of it. That's a good place to be. When you get to the place where you're just like, I, I, there's no more excuses. <laughs> there are no more excuses. I, I don't want this anymore. When you get to that place, verse 19, then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses. This is the third time it's repeated. And look what happens. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. I skipped that verse accidentally, but it's, it's repeated now. This is for the third time. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. I was once searching. I was lost. And he's found me. And I have a habitation in him. I was once shackled in sin. I don't know about you. I say this and people are like, can you say that in church? 
I, I believe with all my heart. God knows. I tried my very best to be good. I got saved, and then the preacher told me I was supposed to be good. And so I tried hard for years. And God walked alongside of me and allowed me to do it. With every, every passing day, I was just more and more exhausted and tired. Until he let me just fall down. Like Paul in Romans chapter 7, the things that I don't want to do are the things that I find myself doing. Why do I keep doing this? I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to do this. Why do I keep doing this? This is what I want to do, but that's not what I end up doing over there. Oh, wretched man that I am, Paul said. I'm, I'm exhausted with me. And then he, he finally comes to the place. Paul was a very religious man in his past. And he doesn't say, preacher, tell me what I need to do, preacher. Tell me, give me the five steps, brother. You just tell me them five steps. Let me write it down here in my journal, man. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. You just watch, preacher. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it this time. I'm even going to start paying my tithes. He says, who, who shall deliver me? If you're here tonight and you're looking for a what, there is no what. There's no this many steps and that many steps. And there's a who. And his name is Jesus. And if you're sick of sin, turn to him as a savior. And he will set you free. It ain't come to Jesus and get your life right. No, just come to Jesus. He'll get your life right. He'll get your life right. There are things that I used to want to do that I don't want to do anymore. And some people would hear that and say, oh, Gordon, he's so, he's such a righteous man. No, he ain't. No, he ain't. He puts his pants on one leg at a time, just like you do. Same passions and desires as everybody else. Maybe the only difference between me and you is I've walked with Jesus longer. That's maybe it. And it doesn't even have to be time. It just might be, I'm a slow learner. You could get on the fast track tonight. That's what I would encourage. Don't be like me. There are things I'm learning tonight that I should have learned that night when I was 15 years old. Just recently sharing that with somebody. Over 30 years, I'm learning now what I should have learned then. That's not how you want to do it. But he's kind and he's gracious and he's patient and he's long suffering. And the search is over. And the shackles are gone. Man. And the healing has begun. Verse 23. Oh, verse 22. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. I'm convinced we don't see more rejoicing in the church because we're our churches are full of people who are still trying to do it themselves. Who's going to praise Jesus when, when they're doing it? Now, they're really not doing it, but they think they're doing it. Can, could we be real tonight? I know some of y'all just kind of got like the stink face when I said that. You well, can't be talking about me. I, I'm not talking about any, anybody in particular, but I've been to church since I was 15 years old, and, and I'm guilty of a lot of stuff I'm talking about. I know what it's like to sit in a pew and be doing it me. And that don't work. And you can fool some folks trying to do it. You might even impress some people trying to do it. But it don't work. But when Jesus starts changing your life, you just might get a little silly. You just might get a little crazy for some people. You just might start talking about him more than you talk about yourself. In ball games. And all that other stuff. And people might think, well, I, I just don't know about that guy. You might lose some friends. You might lose some family. You might lose some church folks. But I'd rather have Jesus and be alone than all of that. Right? And I'm convinced, church, 
If you'll get real with God tonight, he'll get real with you. He'll meet you at that moment and do amazing things in your life. But if they're still pretending, he'll step back and let you play the, play the game. He'll, he'll sit back until the show's over. <laughs> scene one, scene two. <laughs> you go change your clothes, put on another mask. and He'll just, he'll just love you from the audience. Until finally the curtain closes. And the crowd's gone. And nobody's clapping anymore. And it don't do anything for you like it used to. And you stand in the darkness when the spotlight's off. And you think, what am I doing? And then you notice there's one still in the audience. Your greatest fan. The one who loves you, not the dog and pony show you've been doing. Not the act you've been putting on. Not the costume and the makeup, the glitz and the glamour. He loves you. And the beauty is, is, is he's done something spectacular. And he just wants you to have to step off the stage. No more acting. No more pretending. No more doing tricks for a treat. And he's saying, you can sit down now and watch me put on a show for you in your life. Wow. All right. The, the, the storm tossed soul. Uh, we might get to 108. I, I don't know. They that go down into the sea in ships, verse 23, that do business in the great waters. These see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth, the, raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven. They go down into the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits end. You ever been seasick? Some of you. If you haven't, God's been good to you. <laughs> Seasick will make you wish you were dead. I, I, yeah, throw me overboard. Hopefully I'll, I'll get in the midst of the chum and the sharks will eat me and this will be over. But there are storms of life. And it's easy to get seasick in those storms. But I want you to notice something about this. Let's see where we're at here. Verse 25. Look at the, the second word of verse 25. What does it say? You got the right answer. Yeah, you got the right answer. Say it out loud. He. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He. He commandeth and raiseth. The stormy winds. Oh, wait a minute. That just, that, I think that tilted my theology there. God uses storms in our lives. God uses storms. And he does so for different reasons. Sometimes he uses storms to protect us. What? What? Genesis chapter 6, sin was running rampant on planet earth, devastating everything. God looked around and saw one man and his family, eight souls, and said, build an ark because I'm going to wipe this out. I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to protect humanity from itself. You're going to build an ark. You're going to bring those animals on this ark. I'm going to shut you in. It's going to rain 40 days and 40 nights. And I'm going to start over with you. Sometimes storms come to protect us. Sometimes God uses storms to correct us. God says to Jonah, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach that judgment is coming. Jonah says, I ain't going there. He bought his fare. He got on a ship and sailed in the opposite direction. And God caused a storm to come up. Jonah was down in the bottom of the ship asleep. And the men were terrified. They wake him up, call him old sleeper. 
dragging him up to the top and they're trying to figure out why are we in the middle of this storm? Somehow they knew that it was because of somebody on the ship. They cast lots and realize it's you. Who are you? I'm, an, I'm a Hebrew. I'm a prophet. This is because of me. What? They were terrified that God caused the storm. Jonah says, if you throw me overboard, everything will be okay. These men said, no way, we can't do it. They pray out, they pray, and they cry, and they pray, and they cry, and the storm doesn't cease. And finally they say, Lord, forgive us. They throw Jonah overboard, and the Bible says the storm ceased. And the men on the ship sacrificed unto Jehovah. It impacted their life. Jonah goes overboard in the sea, and God prepares a great fish and swallows Jonah up. Takes him to the bottom of the mountains. Jonah cries out. And the whale or the fish barfs Jonah out on the beach. Covered in seaweed. Skin all white and shriveled from being inside of that great fish. Walking into Nineveh. And their God was a fish god called Dagon. And here's a man walking into Nineveh. Shriveled up in white. With seaweed all over himself. Smelling like fish vomit. Forty days and judgment comes. Forty days. He sent a storm to correct. You get all the way to the New Testament. Jesus tells the disciples to cross over to the other side. And he's asleep on the ship. And a great storm comes up. The disciples are running to and fro all over the top of the boat. And they wake up Jesus. Lord, don't you care? Don't you care? We're going to die. Save us. Sometimes storms are to prof pro perfect us. Jesus steps to the bow of the boat and he says, shh. Peace be still. And there was a great calm. And the disciples said, what manner of man is this? Their faith was perfected. Sometimes we're in the middle of the storm so that we can finally see him. What manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? And sometimes God sends storms to direct us. Paul is on his way to Rome. He's appealed to Caesar. He's on a ship and he finds himself in the midst of a storm called Eurycliden, like a hurricane. They get run aground. The back of the ship is being broken apart. They're all terrified. People are trying to sh jump overboard. And they get washed up on an island of Malta. Paul is on his way to Rome, man. He's appealed to Caesar, but God's got a detour for him because there's some barbarians on an island that God wants to save. And so sometimes a storm is just to direct me someplace to wash me, blow me somewhere else where I would have not went myself. But they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, verse 28, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm so that the, wa the waves thereof are still. Then they be glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them out of the... Bringeth, bringeth them unto their desired haven. Wow. The storm-tossed soul that's laboring out in the deep is now found its haven. We used to sing a song in the church I got saved. I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wild seas no more. The tempest I forget how it goes. The tempest may something over the wild stormy seas in Jesus. I'm safe evermore. I forget that last part of the line. But, but that's the idea. He's my haven. He's my habitation. He's my hope. He's my healer. And he's my haven. Let's, let's, well, we, might, we were not going to get to 108. We'll get it. We'll get it. And we'll pick it up next time. He says it again for the fourth time. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. He turneth rivers into wilderness and the water springs into dry ground. A fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. He turneth the wilderness into standing water and dry ground into water springs. He can do it either way. God can flip a situation like that. Depending on the situation, depending on where you're at. And there he maketh the hungry to dwell, that they may prepare a city of habitation. They sow fields and plant vineyards. They yield fruits of increase. He blesseth them also, so that they are multiplied greatly, and suffereth not their cattle to decrease. Again, they are minished and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow. He poureth contempt upon princes, and causeth them to wander in the wilderness. 
where there is no way. Yet he setteth he the poor on high from, for, from affliction and maketh his, him families like a flock. The righteous shall see it. The studious soul. The righteous will study this. He, he'll see this in all of these lives and how the Lord is working. And what will he do? He'll rejoice. Our God is a savior. He saves. Do we still believe that Jesus saves? I do. They will rejoice and all iniquity shall shut her mouth. Shut your mouth. He says, whoso is wise and will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Wow. Man, I'll do 108. Because it's already eight. The loving kindness of the Lord. They'll understand it. When you see people searching and looking. And when they finally find what they're looking for. Man, it's a cause to rejoice. When you see people who have been shackled and in bondage. And now they're free. They're experiencing freedom for the first time in their life. It is called, I rejoice at that. When you, when you see someone who is just sick of sin, they're just ready to repent. They're ready to cry, Uncle Lord, I'm done. I surrender. And healing begins to take place in their life. When you see people come through the storms of life, they cry out to the Lord and he rescues them. He calms the storms. Sometimes he calms the storm. Sometimes he calms his child. Just saying. So don't get discouraged if you're like, Lord, stop this storm. He may be correcting. He may be protecting. He may be perfecting. He may be directing. So you don't want, you don't want the storm to stop. But he'll calm you in the midst of it. Because he's the Prince of Peace. Oh, to know his loving kindness. Amen. Let's stand.